<clears throat> so let's go ahead and continue our conversation about genes and how they work. So keep in mind the central dogma of DNA. I can't tell you guys how important that is to get that concept down and understand the basics behind that. So we talked a little bit about some of the history, some of the players early on in understanding some of the basics about genes. Keep in mind, we had to really figure out DNA before we could really understand genes. So it makes sense that a lot of this is fairly recent information in the last, and when I say recent, I mean, you know, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, even in the last five years, we're still finding so many new things about how our genes work and this process of taking DNA, turning it into RNA and RNA into an actual polypeptide or protein structure. So last lecture, we left off with this slide talking about friends, Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner. They were the ones who started to lay down the foundation about DNA and how that determines the amino acid order. So that string of amino acids, how that is determined by the DNA information. So the term codon, I introduced that in the last lecture. That is an essential thing to remember. A codon represents three nucleotides. You could say the codon is three DNA nucleotides. It then becomes three RNA nucleotides, but that is what equals the amino acid. Three code or three nucleotides, and we collectively call these things codons. So the key is when we're creating the amino acid chain and we're figuring out which amino acid to use, you have to look at the letters, the nucleotides in blocks of three. It does not work with ones or twos or fours. It only works in a block of three. So the analogy is, think about dialing the area code for your phone number. 217-309-801-8800. Three blocks of three. Those are the same as the codons. Okay, so when we look at this, codons determine the amino acids. And if a nucleotide is removed, deleted, taken out, changed, etc., it can disrupt and change the amino acid chain. So we'll get into this a lot more as we get further into this lecture, but this is just to show you the basis of here are the codons, AUG, CCU, ACG, etc. Here are the amino acids that they represent. So you get the string of amino acids. If for some reason this letter C got deleted, it causes everything to shift over and notice how the amino acid chain down here is different. It's because you have to reshuffle everything into the three letter codons to create the amino acid. So removing a letter all of a sudden changes the entire codon. So let me show you a quick example here using the area code scenario. Okay, right, so if here's my phone number, 217 dash 801 dash 4440 three letters three letters continuation of information so you have to read those first three letters and type those in or dial those into your phone for it to work imagine if I took the seven out if I removed the seven when I'm starting to dial the area code I would then go 218 dash 014-440, whatever, whatever, whatever comes after it. Okay, so notice it's completely different. My first group of three has changed, my second group of three has changed, this would change, and so on. It's exactly what we're having happen here when we see mutations occur. So I said we'll revisit this and talk about this a lot more as we get into mutations and look at what's going on there and how does that work. All right, so another important person to associate with this information is Marshall Nirenberg. Now, Nirenberg is an individual, a scientist, who figured out which codons 
specifically work with or code for each specific amino acid. So this little chart here, this is universal across all life. There's lots and lots of different varieties, color variations out there, but they all say the same thing. Your first amino acid, your second amino acid, and then your third amino acid equals a specific, I'm sorry, your first um, nucleotide, your second nucleotide, and your third nucleotide equals a specific amino acid. So if you look at UUU, those three nucleotides code for the amino acid phenylalanine. If we drop down to UUG, that codes for the amino acid leucine, and so on and so on. If you go through the list, go through that chart, there are 20 different amino acids. That's what the majority of life is going to work with, those 20. Now, Nirenberg also found out that there are three codons that represent stop. So when the universal or central dogma of DNA is working, DNA turning into RNA, RNA into the amino acids, there's got to be a point where it says stop. That's enough. We've done all the coding, all the transcription and the translating that we want to do, and our, our protein is big enough. Stop it. Stop coding. It has to see one of those stop codons. On the other side of the codon spectrum is how does it know when to start? It needs to see AUG. That specific codon is what will tell the ribosome, now you begin putting this together. It will not begin the process of transcription or translation. It's not going to translate until AUG comes to the ribosome. So there could be 20 codons before AUG that go to the ribosome, and the ribosome will ignore it until it sees that one. Once it sees that one, it says, okay, time to go. Let's start putting these amino acids together. Let's build the chain until we get to a stop codon. So here again is the big picture. This is right out of the book. This is the genetic code table that all codons are working with. So no matter what three-letter combinations you can create from your RNA information, and remember, RNA has... A, C, G, and U. Those are the nucleotides associated with RNA. So you create any possible combination of words, three-letter words, from those four choices, and it's going to be found on this chart. So cat. You can find that on the chart. Cat, C-A-T. We come down here, find the C's, A's, T's, Oh, I'm sorry, C-A-U. My mistake, there's no T in the RNA. That's why I can't find it. C-A-U, here's our C-A-U. That represents histidine. Now what if we went tag? Can't do tag because there's a T. How about U-A-G? U-A-G. We come back to our chart, and we go U, A, G. Oh, that's actually one of Nuremberg's stop codons. If we went A, 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 we go onto the chart, and we find A, A, A over here, lysine. If we do something like G, A, G, gag, G, A, G, down here on the chart, we're going to find gag represents the amino acid glutamate. Okay, so this can go on and on and on. Any three-letter combination you can create is represented down here by one of these 20 amino acids. That is universal across all life. So we are saying it's universal. As far as we know at this point, it is practically universal. We don't know of things that do not use this process. All living things share the same process, the same pattern. This points towards common ancestry. Some early ancestor of all life, this pathway, this central dogma of DNA evolved, and it's been handed down from generation to generation to generation across billions of years of life. Um, 
So the pig's over here. One's got pink, and the other one has yellow with its nose. The reason we can change the color of that pig's nose is by tweaking the DNA. Because, ooh, we want to change the color. If we change the DNA, that changes the RNA, that changes the expression of the protein. If we can tweak it in a pig, we can tweak it in any other species out there. So understanding this code helps us with these advances we're making in genetic engineering, creating new um, antibiotics, creating new types of species, new plants for farming, new animals for domestication, new medicines, biotechnology. All of it is based off of our understanding of this genetic code and how it works. So again, the more comfortable we are with this, the more possibilities we have to do amazing things with this information. So we're going to now look at prokaryotic transcription. How does it work? What does it do? It's going to be a little different than the eukaryotic. You guys will do this in a lot more detail later on when you go into other courses. I'm just wanting you to get an overview, kind of a big picture idea of how this works and what it does. So with prokaryotic transcription, it's going to require what we call promoter. That kind of says, hey, let's get this going. Let's get the party started here. A start site, a location on the chromosome that says, here's where you begin. The what we call transcription unit, something to transcribe the information from DNA to RNA. And then there's going to be a termination site where it says, okay, that's the end of this process. We got all the information we need. Okay, so when we look at it, what I have next is kind of a summary slide that shows the basics. Here's your RNA polymerase. This is going to be your structure that's going to help everything happen. The promoter gets it all going, gets the process started, gets everything kind of functioning here. The DNA strand is going to go through that polymerase. It's going to go through the center, this little kind of what almost looks like your thumb and first finger sticking off of it. It's going to go through that. And as it passes through that, the DNA gets split open. The promoter sequence says, Okay, here's where we're going to start this process. Opens up the helix, and as the helix opens up, RNA synthesis begins based on one side of that DNA strand. And it's going to start to replicate and take the DNA information, switch it over into RNA information. Okay, so here's a bit more detail, a little bit more of a magnification. Here's the DNA strand. It's got to get unwound, kind of opened up. And as the RNA comes in here, and it goes, and it keeps adding those appropriate nucleotides based on the template of the DNA that's being used. And that zips its way through. The DNA then gets rewound and basically wound back up and closed. But this area here is what is being used to code today. Next week, it may be an area further down here. It may be an area way over here on this DNA strand at a different point in the prokaryotic cell's life cycle. That's why genes and ge the expression of our genes and traits change over time. So kind of a bigger picture, as the RNA strand gets elongated and keeps coming out, it will actually spin and create this little hairpin that causes it to pause, allowing this to get everything attached. And then once it says, okay, we got enough, we have our complete information, it's going to pop off. This is what we call the disassociation from the DNA. <clears throat> it says, you know what, that's it. That's the last one we need. We got all the nucleotides in this strand. Let's make this little pin pop off, we're done. DNA strand wraps itself back up, keeps going through its cycle, but now you have the RNA information sitting there in hand and available to then translate into the amino acid chain. Okay, so what we'll look at with prokaryotic transcription, it is coupled to translation.